Hello, I'm Lloyd Maeve Houston. I'm Aoife Fritnach. And welcome to Censored, where this season we are exploring the history of the censorship of films in Ireland. And this week, you can clutch your rosaries because we are focusing on blasphemy. So I can kick us off then. There is something that's very boring, but actually really technically important to do with blasphemy and Irish law. And it's called the Defamation Act of 1961. And in Section 13, it talks about a blasphemous libel, which sounds very exotic. And when this act was first put before the Doyle in 1961, There had been actually a six-week drought of new movies, apparently, according to the Irish press. Very serious. That's a that's a huge gap in a release schedule. I know. (laughs) So anyway, there was a glut of new things, and Michael Mills accordingly went along to the pictures and watched them all, presumably within a week. And one of the ones he mentioned was an Elvis Presley vehicle called Flaming Star which has some very dodgy racial politics that we won't get into right now. (laughs) So the review by Michael Mills. So he goes to the theatre and it's an Elvis vehicle. So obviously it's full of lots of very excitable young ladies because they're there to see the king. Um, And they say what Michael Mills says is that they spend a lot of the film actually screaming. He says they screamed for him on every occasion when he took off his shirt and when he put on his shirt. And the loudest scream of the lot was reserved for the end when he appeared with the shirt in ribbons around him after being half murdered by Indians. Obviously, they were determined to scream for the poor fella, dead or alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice to know that the censor didn't cut naked Elvis. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that, that is that is progress. <laughs> So shall we move on to the definition, sort of a basic definition of what blasphemy might be? Or I guess the different kinds of blasphemy that seem to have troubled the different censors. One that really caught my eye, actually, this is very boring, but you know, in the dictionary, when they actually define where the words come from, Mm. I normally don't do this because it's it's a bit geeky. Well, but, this defines marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going to go that far into it, okay? Because the roots of blasphemy are Greek. And so it's in two halves. And the first Greek word is blaptine, which means to injure. And the second half, theme, which means reputation. Ah. So I was like, reputation? That's weird. Are we saying... That God has like a sensitive soul that he can be insulted if people God's, say bad things about him. If it's good enough for Taylor Swift, it's good enough for God. You got a <laughs> re- reputation is all, all important. So he's kind of like an image or a sense of honor or it's, it was just for me a peculiar well, kind I, of I, I, concept I, to come from. No, completely. But I, I, it does fit with sort of what you were saying about it being a sort of species of libel, right? Or like blasphemous libel, as well as, you know, obscene libel and so on. God is a figure with public standing that could be injured in some way. Yeah, like you have to be, take into account his feelings, like, you know, be <laughs> nice to him because he's, he's delicate. And one of the synonyms that came up a lot was reverence, which mm. I thought was really interesting because it implies an agreement with the very foundational concepts of a religion to have to actually revere the concepts. It's a really big and important category, I think, in terms of offence. No, absolutely. And it's it's also one that invites the Irish censor to work beyond the mandated bounds of his brief. One area of anxiety that's not unique to the Irish censor, it must be said, concerns the incarnation of Christ, right? There's a big taboo or felt taboo around the materialization is the term that's often used of Christ as a depicted figure and kind of questions. Is this, about is this across all denominations? Like, because Catholics have loads of statues of Christ. Yeah, I was going to say that there's an irony here, which is that, yeah, you know, th- this seems to be a very sort of conventionally Protestant concern about like, you know, make ye no graven images um, sort of spirit. But there's something about maybe the medium of cinema, I guess, that, that seems to kind of invite this. So Montgomery, the first censor who holds the post from 1923 to 1940, is particularly sort of fretful 
about it. In 1925, um, he files a report on a film called INRI, um, which is a, a German film in which a death row inmate repents and converts after a prison chaplain narrates the life of Christ to him. And I think it's kind of intercut with like depictions of that. And Montgomery said in that report, I've made it a rigid rule to reject films in which Christ is materialized. The meeting with Mary Magdalene is shown with a lack of reticence and the excessive details showing crucified torture excite horror rather than reverence. There's that word, reverence. Montgomery was not alone in feeling that this was a kind of issue that, that merited prohibition. So upon taking over as head of the BBFC in 1916, um, the Liberal MP T.P. O'Connor published this sort of list, 43 grounds for deletion. So he'd sort of gone through the previous reports of the BBFC and tried to kind of codify something sort of resembling a list of reasons why things have been cut. And the 43rd of the reasons for deletion was the materialization of the conventional figure of Christ. So I don't know if you get to materialize unconventional Christs by that rationale. <laughs> that's I mean, pretty... maybe that's the loophole that allows nativity plays and church plays. It's like, yep. clearly Christ was not a child. Not this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think for Montgomery, it seems like one of the kind of big issues was the environment in which this a depiction of Christ, however reverent, would be viewed, right? So the, the sense that instead of it being, you know, in a somber and solemn, reflective, quiet, ecclesiastical space. Instead, it would be in this space that people associated with and that was synonymous with popular entertainment. Mm. So he says, one must consider the environment in which the picture is to be shown and decide if it is proper to exhibit it as part of the entertainment offered in a cinema theatre. I have no power to impose restrictions or conditions which might ensure its reverent reception by ordinary picture house audiences. Yes, yeah, so it's in the midst of these beautifully appointed picture houses uh, sitting next to someone you might fancy the arse off of and are going on a date with and you are watching Christ on the screen. Yeah, not not the right mindset. I mean, kind of fair, fair fucks to anyone who, who manages to like cop off during the crucifixion or something. That's, that's, that's a commitment to getting laid. I mean, yeah, what a date movie that would be like. <laughs> Just <laughs> awful. <laughs> should we, yeah, should we go to Passion of the Christ and get passionate? <laughs> um, I mean, given how many people went to the every single film, inevitably people went on dates to to know one another <laughs> in the biblical sense. <laughs> I mean, it, it reminds me of um, a set of comments made by our, our old friend William McGinnis in those debates. You know, when he talks about uh, that screening of the that Italian adaptation of Inferno that he goes to see, where, you know, he kind of reports on the awful Philistine Dublin audiences that instead of, you know, reverently watching Dante and kind of being edified by it, like hoot and holler every time there's a sort of, you know, particularly spectacular sequence and like boo Satan and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, depicting or incarnating Christ is a testy issue. But the problem with materializing Christ, of course, is also then sort of feeds into the problem of how do we define blasphemy, which is the same as indecency and obscenity. And in the 1923 Act, which all the censors are working from, they are allowed ban something if it's indecent, obscene or blasphemous. So unlike with the newspapers and the books, they can actually say this film is blasphemous. And I think that leads to kind of more unusual decisions, doesn't it? As, as we shall see, um, <laughs> some some interesting moves and some weirdly self-contradictory moments. So we'll maybe talk about it in more detail later, but the R Centre is thrown into a complicated position by the release of Cecil B. DeMille's The King of Kings. So from the king to the king of kings, <laughs> Jesus does not appear shirtless, um, sadly. <laughs> Um, that's a shame but it's a good segue anyway <laughs> it's well i mean it's it's not one of those kind of like shredded christs you know like you get you get those real kind of like veiny sort of oh he, he's been at the crossfit sort of jesus is this is this is demille's christ is is a lot more sort of be beatific than that um but you have an interesting situation where montgomery bans the film initially but in the act of banning it, immediately recommends it himself to the um, appeals board for their consideration. So he basically says, I feel duty bound to ban this, but I want you to overturn my decision. 
because it is probably sufficiently reverent to be permitted for a kind of wide screening. I think he's also in a difficult position because by the time he's sort of getting his hands on it, various representatives of different denominations have kind of come forward to say, oh yeah, no, this is is good stuff. It's also, it's made with direct consultation of Father Daniel Lord SJ, who is um, the, the man who goes on to draft the Hayes Code. But yeah, it's just an interesting moment where it's like, oh, by one rationale, this is blasphemous and I should ban it. But equally, this serve some kind of evangelical purpose that I'm, mm. I am comfortable with and thus should be permissible. And Daniel Lord as well, he actually writes loads of these pamphlets that he publishes in America that are then republished in Ireland by the Catholic Truth Society. Yes, so yeah, yeah. all of these things about how to marry a Catholic if you're not one, you know, what to expect when you marry into this crazy religion. Don't feed them after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> But it has these amazing, these amazing covers. If you look up Catholic Truth Society, they recently had exhibitions of these incredible works of graphic art. They're really modern and really cutting edge and very attractive. And they're coming, you know, directly from America. These are written for the American market, which is just fascinating. All Mm. these instructions on how to date are written for American teenagers and being read by Irish teenagers. (laughs) <laughs> Such a different universe. So tell me about the King of Kings then. Okay, it's the middle chapter in what becomes a sort of trilogy of biblical epics by Cecil B. DeMille. So DeMille, I mean, probably kind of needs no introduction, but he was a driving force in the kind of development of cinema and the creation of Hollywood particularly. So he is one of the people who sort of pushes to move from making short films to what we now consider feature-length films. He is one of the people who, by establishing his sort of business in Hollywood, makes it this community for filmmaking that it goes on to be. And yeah, he's known on the one hand for lavish production values and a willingness to use the sensual and sensational as the basis for spectacle. But he's also a man of quite sincere religious conviction who sees his filmmaking as part of a kind of secular ministry. So he late in his life, he sort of declared my ministry was making religious movies and getting more people to read the Bible than anyone else ever has. I mean, okay, that's very ambitious. <laughs> well, it, but I, I, I think it kind of captures the weird interplay there, where on the one hand, there's like, you know, it, it, from a religious standpoint, a laudable commitment to a democratization of access to, you know, religious material or whatever, or lending a mass appeal to, to faith. But on the other hand, even there, he's almost talking about like box office receipts or something. It's like, <laughs> I made more people read the Bible. My Bible opening was bigger than anyone else's <laughs> blockbuster yeah. rendering. Yeah. Um, fuck you, Pope. I got them to read the Bible more than them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I am, you know, <laughs> the Catholic church should take a leaf out of my book. And I mean, and partly this is a byproduct of the fact like he's a son of a cleric but also he's i think episcopalian (coughs) descent and all of his kind of passion projects are these big religious movies so sometimes they're biblical sometimes they're not so he also makes films like the godless girl which is a sort of panic movie about atheism and stuff but even that you can you can hear there it's like oh the godless girl i wonder what she gets up to sounds Um, great (laughs) yeah (laughs) well this is the thing i can't remember who it is but someone sort of a, a critic castigates him for making these movies where you can have six reels of sin as long as in the seventh reel the sinners are notionally punished And so the way DeMille goes about this in King of Kings is wild. (laughs) And I'm actually really here for it. So it... I have never seen this, so enlighten me. So it opens, A, in glorious Technicolor, like an early kind of two-tone sort of version of of Technicolor. And it's very interesting where he chooses to sort of deploy his resources in what form. But it opens in... Well, A, we open with the title card being like, please don't get angry at us. (laughs) effectively the film frames itself as an extension of christ's missionary project so the opening title card says he himself capital he capital himself Uh, uh, commanded that his message be carried to the uttermost parts of the earth may this portrayal play a reverent part in the spirit of that great command so reverent again yeah (laughs) and then we we jump to um a version of mary magdalene but instead of being you know 
the fairly ordinary sex worker that she seems to have been in, in most sort of biblical renderings of her, she is elevated to the status of a courtesan in Ooh. this kind of Roman space. So she's depicted in this like Princess Leia style gold bikini. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. With a big red cloak and um, this, this like fabulous sort of hairdo that to my mind evokes almost kind of like Medusa's, like these snake-like sort of little fringe tendrils. And she's there laid out on, you know, kind of a chaise long, surrounded by these like hideous orientalized caricatures and representatives of different Middle Eastern sort of nations. Um, and there's a leopard and she like, that's brought over to her on a lead and she kind of kisses it. And one of the, I think the guy who's meant to be kind of the, a representative of the sort of Roman faction is like, oh, you know, Mary, why, if you shower beasts with your kisses, why do you not shower them on me? So, you know, already we've got a kind of weird insinuation of like animal kind of sexual activity and or bestiality. Ooh. Good work, Mr. DeMille. But what DeMille has done is position her in a romantic relationship with Judas. So what? she's like, where is Judas? He hasn't come to see me in days. And they're like, oh, he's following this carpenter guy who has these magic abilities. <laughs> you know, I hear he hath made the blind to see and, you know, the lame to walk. And she's like, right, we'll fucking see about that. Summons her <laughs> zebra-drawn chariot. <laughs> Oh, this is lush. This yeah. is great. So four zebras <laughs> rock up pulling a chariot and she hops aboard and lashes her way out. And the whole thing is a big mood. Like I am I am fully here for for this depiction of Mary Magdalene. Then we kind of jump over to we jump out of color and into black and white and oh so it's a it's both yeah it toggles between them but that yeah. sequence i find it really interesting that if we're thinking about you know where you put the money or where you put the kind of technical mm. effort demille notwithstanding the kind of you know he himself have given me permission to make this movie for you with a you know sanctified purpose he's basically just like no 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 big full color opening sexy lady riding a chariot lots of zebras <laughs> <laughs> she might have sex with cheetahs we don't know <laughs> full color anyway <laughs> um, anyway biblical stuff black and white yeah yeah, yeah. but what, what we then get is you know kind of classic like suffer the children to come unto me so you know we see mark having been the young mark having had his capacity to walk restored to him um, and there's a blind a very photogenic very kind of you know implausibly white <laughs> blind girl who's led to jesus and in a cinematographically actually very cool sort of sequence basically we sort of focalize through her so the movie really like withholds depicting jesus for as long as possible Sting. and so there's lots of talk around him you know we see the virgin mary with a, 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 a frankly implausible number of doves and eventually <laughs> the child is brought into the presence of a not yet seen christ and then we see the kids sort of bathed in light. So one of the technical innovations of the movie is to play with lighting a great deal. So some stuff is like overexposed or there's like superimposed sort of beams coming down from heaven. And the kids bathed in light. And then we see this really out of focus image that slowly resolves into what is the child's eye view of the beatific face of Jesus ah. haloed in light. Which, you know, is a, a great sort of coup de cinema, but also... It shows the extent to which DeMille is, like, aware that depicting Christ is a, is a bold problem. act, right? It, it's a kind of, you know, cl the climax of, like, that reel mm. is sort of seeing Jesus. Just to resolve the Mary Magdalene stuff, she rocks up after this healing has occurred, rocks up on her chariot and is like, Judas, where are you at? And Judas is played by, like, a very kind of femme, like, a very pretty um, <laughs> Judas um who's who's deeply sus and who were explicitly told is like no 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 i'm following jesus because when he becomes the king of this terrestrial realm i'll be his like right hand and keeps telling uh, people that it's like keep, keep it on the dl Judas. <laughs> but mary magdalene rocks up you know full of like fury and utterly magnificent looking and we then get this multiple exposure sequence where she's confronted with christ and he expels the seven deadly sins from her 
and each of the zins is like this ghostly superimposed hideous feminized figure looming out of mary magdalene so you know got like wow. lust and greed and envy and and eventually you know jesus sweeps his arm beatifically and all of them are cast screaming out of her that sounds wild yeah no no it and it looks class like it's, but yeah so the, the movie is i mean this basically establishes the pattern for the film where you get these kind of like genuinely if you were religious i think fairly sort of sensitively handled quiet moments where a very stately reverent slightly distant christ you know does his thing and then these lurid moments that feel like they've kind of crashed in from a different movie (laughs) just to be like whoa look at this um and that the crowd pleasing set piece moment so yeah exactly and 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 each sort of reel of the movie basically does one and then the other so it's you know Mm -hmm. Quite like Garden of Gethsemane, kicking everything over in the temple, which involves a frankly implausible number of sheep. <laughs> just, <laughs> just running oxen, sheep, goats through <laughs> that space. As many extras as you can fit in as possible. Now, the film, broadly speaking, has a kind of easy time of it with Christian religious leaders who buy the line that it's, you know, a reverent religiously sort of act. inspired kind yeah of thing. um the people who do object to it and have a much more i think kind of substantial objection to make are jewish religious leaders in the anti-defamation yeah. league basically the primary antagonist in the movie apart from judas or who who is you know colluding with judas is caiphas um you know our i can't remember if he's a pharisee or a sadducee or but you know he, he's oh. a kind of moderately invented high priest figure who is just a grab bag of every kind of anti-semitic trope imaginable so he's kind of depicted as fairly sort of physically hideous money grubbing you know he's gloating over these piles of gold and he's basically dogging jesus through the movie often depicted by giant stars of david and stuff being like i'm gonna get that pesky jesus (laughs) um god and it's awful yeah it's entirely justifiably um the anti-defamation league sort of say well you're you are just reheating a set of anti-semitic tropes here and you're propagating the idea that the jews are the killers of christ etc to the point where demille re-edits the film to downplay some of this material not terribly successfully it must be said even in his kind of autobiographies you find him sort of trying to address this what he feels is a misapprehension about the film but he sort of says you know that it, it is obviously a lie that the jewish people are in toto responsible so he you know he's alive to this um, before the film is sort of aired but yeah so it's this this kind of fascinating mix of the the deeply serious and the luridly spectacular uh, that is very demille and i think it's exactly that sort of combination of things that montgomery finds sort of hard to to navigate and that's why and what happens when he refers it to the appeal board so they pass the film sort of a few days later with with cuts but to i think i probably minimize some of the kind of mary magdalene of it all it's an interesting beast in the sense that while to my you know contemporary eye this does not strike me as blasphemous i do understand why someone of montgomery's species of orthodox catholicism would feel kind of wrong-footed by like Mm. this very weird blend of deep reverence in places and then like lurid pageantry in others (laughs) it's just too commercial really it's it's that word he uses a lot, vulgar. He mm. really hates vulgar. And there must be like, those moments are close to vulgar. And then it's redeemed by sensitive, godly bits. I mean, also for for a man who is like deeply uncomfortable with even kind of suggested nudity, like Mary Magdalene on, on her kind of pimped ride <laughs> in, her, in her spangled <laughs> bikini. It's like, yeah, this is, this is not his jam. <laughs> <laughs> and but you can see why it made so much money because that would be everybody else's jam yeah it it, it is certainly my jam i can confirm listeners this is <laughs> this is my jam <laughs> watch that opening sequence and that's that's how i want to arrive at all parties from from here on <laughs> oh that's really good i mean the one that i chose to watch is from 1946 so it's a bit further and to link to the Technicolor one, Black Narcissus from Powell and Pressburger was like a really important moment in Technicolor film history. It made a big splash cinematography wise. The audiences were wildly impressed by the color that they used, particularly when they showed 
these flowers in some of the opening scenes. So it's extremely lush, mm. right? So it's a very visually rich and sensually rich film, really. Even though the story itself, like... What Montgomery said was that it depicted a travesty of convent life. So <laughs> it's set in a convent, and that's obviously a travesty. But really, he objected that it had a sex atmosphere right through it. <laughs> and you're like, sex atmosphere? I mean, what is that? So obviously, I had to. I mean, I had seen it before, but mm. I hadn't thought of it as a sex atmosphere film. How did I miss it? It is absolutely saturated in the possibility of sex no okay. actual sex mm. just the possibility so the story is a group of english-speaking nuns they're anglican nuns not catholic nuns they travel to a new mission it's supposed to be in the himalayas and they're put into this building by the local potentate the raja or as he's called the general and he donates them a building which had been occupied by brothers as in a order of male religious, but they gave up. And so the women are sent to try out this place. And the building they occupy is, it's totally ridiculous. The scenario makes no sense. Actually, it's based on a novel from 1939, which wasn't banned, right? So the novel was read, but the film was banned in Ireland. And so they arrive in this ridiculous building, which everyone lives in the valley, so all the villagers live in the valley and the nuns are living on an outcrop <laughs> on a building that's hanging onto the edge of a cliff. <laughs> subtle symbolism. Very subtle, yeah. <laughs> and the wind howls through it the whole time and the air is too clear and it's it's all very intense, according to Sister Cloda, who's played by Deborah Kerr. I just I was thinking it's it's obviously just too close to heaven, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the real reason this building is a problem is it used to be it used to house the local rajah's harem. So, I mean, it was a private brothel, really. <laughs> Some sort of sex atmosphere, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> you might say that. I mean, but the for the the local potentate, he's like, so all of these women need some place to live. Well, I have a house where loads of women used to uh, yeah, live. Yeah, I, I women. know where to store women. <laughs> <laughs> but also, of course, inevitably, I was like, the practicalities of any time he felt horny, he had to go all the way up to the top of a mountain. I mean, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> just keep him on sight, you know. It just makes no sense. But of course, you know, dramatically, mm. it's very interesting. So they arrive in this place and <laughs> the set itself <laughs> was ridiculous. So the doors of these rooms, these very ornate rooms, there's one beautiful room. It's very blue and it has lots of paintings on the wall and it's very opulent. The nuns are use it, but they don't like using it because it's clearly the relics of this harem mm -hmm. Are there so there are kind of outlines of half naked ladies <laughs> uh, in the filigree window. It's a very sinewy woman dancing. I mean, <laughs> it is very funny to see the nuns standing in, in their beautiful yeah. <laughs> habits, standing in front of like sexy scenes in the background. But the really bit, the bit that I like, I laughed out loud when the doors open. The doors have all these embossed designs on them which just looked like a door of tits <laughs> <laughs> just looks like a door of tits <laughs> and because it's a harem place you're like it probably is supposed that, to be that, a yeah, door that, of tits that, that is... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, yeah it's a lot of doorknobs <laughs> it's a, a lot of doorknobs and sister claude the, head the door of knobs is a different door <laughs> That's a different type of harem, yeah. you know? <laughs> That's the adjoining wing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Deborah Kerr, as Sister Cloda, is sitting in a room and all the nuns are opening the door and it's covered in all these embossed. I mean, I thought it was hilarious, right? I, you know, because they're all so beautifully, you know, reserved. Mm. And as they are playing nuns, they're you know, covered from head to toe. All you can see is literally the triangle of their face because it's the really old-fashioned mm. outfits. And so you've got 
these very sparsely dressed women surrounded by this opulent, OTT, sexy background. So yeah, that obviously was a little bit of a problem. And in in terms of the sort of sex atmosphere, again, f- forgive me because I've not seen the film, is it the kind of latent implication that this guy could at some point, you know, lay claim to these cloistered women? Or is it sapphic energy between the sisters? I would say that it is more that the Raja sort of, yeah, it's the first option. Okay. I don't think there's much really sapphic tension between the women it's more focused on not me not really the raja because that wouldn't be appropriate him being of a foreign persuasion Mm. but the raja has an englishman who works for him Ah. and he's his local agent i don't know why he needs an agent who's an englishman but anyway that yeah Yeah. why why would why would someone from a place need a foreign intermediary (laughs) to act uh, uh, okay yeah let's let's not overthink it yeah, no, I I don't know either. That did occur to me. A suitably anyway, tempting this, Englishman is is in in the vicinity. There has to be a tempting Englishman because the ladies are English, right? <laughs> so this film made David Farrer a star, right? Like this shot him into the stratosphere, and it's really no wonder because he arrives. <laughs> I mean, it's a very memorable entrance. I don't know how he kept a straight face. So he's riding the smallest pony in the world. <laughs> And he's a very tall man, so his legs are like, you know, fully scissored under him. And he is wearing very short shorts, sandals, and a shirt with short sleeves and kind of buttoned down, and a very tatty hat. And it, at this point in the film, he's come to drop off a girl for them to sort of rehabilitate and educate. Right, right. And there's this very tense scene with Sister Clodo where she's like, who is this girl? And he just says nothing, and he just looks at her. And we're all like, mm. okay, so is she your illegitimate daughter? Is she your cast off mistress? What's going on yeah. here? So they they sort of like, Cloda just goes, okay, well, I suppose it's my job as a nun to take these kind of projects on. I'm supposed to be reforming people. So whatever is going on, either she's your illegitimate child or your lover, either way, bad. So I have to step in and take over. And it's just wonderful because of the way he says nothing to her direct question. So you think, okay, so he's getting slightly progressively more naked. And (laughs) then there is an emergency when someone starts to ring the bell and the bell of the convent can be heard in the valley. So he's sitting in his veranda next to his tame monkey or whatever, and he's drinking wine and he's looking particularly loose because he's only wearing shorts at this point. (laughs) No shirt. Taking taking a a, a leaf out of Elvis's book. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. He hears the bell and he's like, quick, get my pony. I mean, he has time to put his hat on, but Mm. he does not have time to put his shirt on. I feel this is gratuitous. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very sort of scraggy, not quite sort of bucket hat, but like a, a sort of I guess maybe one of those Australian sort of frontier hats that's, but like the brim has sagged. <laughs> it's lost its structural integrity. <laughs> and... This is the hat of a man who's wearing a hat for decency's sake, but couldn't give a shit, really. Yes. About hat. So he bursts in and nobody says anything about the fact that he's not wearing a shirt, which is remarkable because <laughs> he's the only person who goes around naked in this film. And there's these amazing shots with, you know, Sister Cloda standing next to him. And there's something about the contrast between all the white habit and this tanned, hairy man (laughs) with no clothes on. It's absolutely brilliant. And there's these amazing moments of tension between himself and Sister Cloda that are so understated. But because they're so rare, there's that like, you're like, oh, what is going on here? Like when one of the nuns makes coffee and he, he drinks it. And his face, like behind the coffee cup, goes, oh, my God. And he looks over at Sister Clodagh and she looks over the coffee cup and they look at each other and they go, you know, <laughs> one of those kind of shots. Mm, yeah, it's yeah. very good. No, it's it's very subtle. OK, mm. there is a nun, though, Sister Ruth, who clearly has the hots for Mr. Dean and is extremely flustered and follows him around and everything. So there's one of the nuns is quite obviously into him and Sister Clodagh might be into him. Maybe we're, you know, she's really trying not to give herself away. So, yeah, I think the sex atmosphere was pretty much David Farrer walking around with no clothes on. A one man walking sex atmosphere. 
But then the travesty of convent life, I was thinking, what what do they mean by that? And I thought it could be because they were Anglican nuns for a Catholic like the Irish censor. The idea that Anglicans can have nuns is deeply confusing. And these nuns also only have annual vows. They don't have perpetual vows. They renew uh, them. Okay. So I thought that was a weird thing so and then went a down a rabbit hole. Model rather than... <laughs> <laughs> that is a good way of thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was made up, right? Because I was like, what? There's, there's a thing where you don't take perpetual vows? And I looked it up and it turns out the Daughters of Charity run this particular system where they do an annual renewal okay. of vows. Who knew? Hmm. I assume, is does that eventually facilitate one of them not renewing their vows and winding up with your man? Or Yes, what happens is Sister Ruth decides that she's going to not renew her vows and she's going to leg it down the mountain in a red dress <laughs> with matching red lipstick. She looks extremely fetching, I have to say. And very technicolour. Extremely technicolour. I mean, the way that they focus in on, on her hair and everything, yeah. Beautiful. So <laughs> anyway, when he rejects her, he is completely fully clothed. What a what a prick tease this guy I is. I know. <laughs> He's sending mixed messages, yeah, isn't he? Good lord, pick a lane. <laughs> <laughs> you scraggly shirtless man. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> yes, the travesty of convent life is that one of them tries to bugger off with Mr. Dean. He says no emphatically. He has no interest. But the other travesty is that Sister Cloda is one of those nuns who's depicted as perhaps not having the right kind of vocation, as in she joins because her plans to marry the guy she was into fall uh, through. You see, it's right. quite sad. And interestingly, that section, we learn that Sister Cloda is Irish. Well, I was going to say with a name like Sister Cloda... Yes, yeah. So she had been living in a kind of Irish gentry setting and they show scenes that are clearly Irish with a hunting over the you know, fox hunting. Okay. Yeah. And I looked it up and actually that was filmed in Tipperary. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, okay. it was the uh, Scartine Hunt, whose nickname is the Black and Tans. <laughs> the Black Narcissus and Tans. <laughs> <laughs> well, this section of Sister Cloda's past life before she becomes a nun was actually cut in America because the Catholic Legion of Decency didn't want it shown that Sister Cloda was joining the nunnery for the wrong reasons. You know, she mm. had to be inspired by God rather than the fact that her boyfriend dumped her. So they actually cut those and Powell and Pressburger supervised the cuts and they were fine with that because they weren't actually going to get much of a US showing had they not cut it. So that really leads me to ask, well, OK, so other Catholics said cut out the bit that makes the nun look human. Why didn't the Irish censor do the same, you know? Mm. And I think it has to be David Farrer and just all of those legs and arms and hair. Just too too much sexy Brit going <laughs> And, you know, Borg I mean, didn't die so that so that Brits could be sexy on our screens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Powell himself said it was the most erotic film he ever made. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, well, obviously it's about the nuns and their erotic fantasies. But I think it's really about the objectification of this man's body through the, the camera the clothes that he doesn't wear, the lighting, the director's choices. And I think that someone like an Irish censor couldn't really articulate why this was so hard for him to watch. Because male nakedness isn't something that's usually socially constructed as inappropriate. I mean, men wearing shorts mm. or going around with no tops on because it's hot, that's just normal. Whereas, of course, women face a whole other gamut of social judgment if they were not wearing very many clothes so i think that they use the blasphemy thing as an excuse to ban it because although you could have cut the bits mm. about sister soda you could never have cut all of the parts well, where mr dean shows up naked it, it's the it's the atmosphere thing right and that's and that's something that the censor is very alive to but ill-equipped for right is sort of like yes. the the vibe is hot 
and you can't like it is you can't cut a vibe <laughs> much like may west you can't cut all of the film <laughs> yeah you can't make may west not sexy so the nuns have to abandon the convent because sister ruth goes insane tries to kill sister cloda oh my god <laughs> I know, it's wild. <laughs> that was not a development I was expecting. Well, you see, because Mr. Dean said no to Ruth. So she legs it back up the hill, which takes her not very long at all, given how far away mm. she is, and uh, attacks Sister Cloda because she thinks that, you know, she's the problem. She clearly suspects what's going on between mm. Cloda and Mr. Dean. Okay, you know? I get you. So she goes back up and they fight over the bell and... Yes, so Sister Ruth falls off the cliff and then they, they decide they have to leave after that. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, we, we don't want this coming back on us. We need to we need to get out of here. Get in the car. Get in the car. Don't look back. <laughs> well, they're all psychologically disintegrating. The gardener is planting flowers instead of vegetables. People are losing their minds, really. It's all falling apart. Okay. As it must have done for the, the brothers before them. This is obviously a cursed building. Right, 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 right. So yeah, the sexiness of it is both like the color and the intensity of the color, hmm. but also the way that they're using that to frame that man's body, I think. Because they do not at all suggest that the nuns are really sexual. I mean, Sister Ruth comes across as batshit crazy rather than mm. sexy. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a really interesting film in that the sex atmosphere part of it is absolutely, he was spot on there. That is exactly what it is. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the thing, right? Again and again, I think we're going to come back to moments where while we disagree that these things are objectionable, you can't actually fault the objection you know like it, it it does accurately pick out something that is going on in the film mm. it's just you know we would obviously quite like to see sexy people be sexy at each other in <laughs> in, 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 in glorious technicolor even if on tiny ponies yeah the tiny ponies so i think under the Hayes code though isn't the Hayes code like taking the lord's name in vain that's the blasphemy one isn't it um well okay so Per our don'ts and be carefuls list, yeah, pointed profanity by title or lip is the number one. Mm. So in that sense, no. I think about both films. The Lord's name is is not taken in vain, I suppose. Licentious or suggestive nudity? I don't know. I, I don't know how shirtless an Englishman needs shirtless to be. Shirtless man. How, how short those shorts have to get before it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're crossing a line. And again, I, and I feel like Mary Mary Magdalene comes comes pretty close. Oh, I think that, yes, yes. I suppose ridicule, ridicule of the clergy would be the hmm. kind of, for, for the Black Narcissus, might be. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it wouldn't really be ridicule, but I can see how if you were predisposed to be super sensitive, you could interpret that. Yeah. as. I mean, this is like the blasphemy with the reputation thing. Yes. This is, this is not ridicule as in slagging them off or insulting them, but it is Bringing suggesting the that they are the human. Bringing the institution into dis disrepute or something exactly but yeah 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 the king of kings doesn't it doesn't depict miscegenation but it certainly like heavily sort of signals and i guess like the, mm. the that that raja figure hovering in the background with his kind of yeah i think that's definitely suggested yeah. yes yeah, yeah yeah i mean the racial politics of the black narcissists are trash by the way yeah Those yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just in case anyone is wondering but yeah so from from the king to the king of kings to <laughs> Uh, an unusually sen sensuous Englishman. We've. <laughs> I mean, bet you didn't think they had it in them. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what it is. <laughs> We're getting into definitions again. We're back this is to dodgy. The, the knob door. Uh, <laughs> well, on that on that note. On that note, yeah, I think knob doors, tit doors, it's it's all into play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.